Good evening, everybody. Very warm welcome on behalf of INHAF to the webinar entitled Inventing Institutional Structures for Delivering Affordable Shelter. We are living in extremely uncertain times. Most severe disruption happened in our cities since independence due to the pandemic. The pandemic has led to the life and livelihood conflict to return migration of millions from our cities to the villages. In absence of basic urban safety net, the livelihoods of daily wage earners, workers, people in construction sites, factories, malls, hotels, households, and street vendors across the country have been severely jeopardized. There is no sign yet towards recovery from the economic and social distress prevailing for almost two years in our cities. We, on behalf of INHAF and over 50 urban professionals and civil society organizations, academic and research institutions, have been hosting series of webinars, 55th is this one, I guess, since June 2020 on the theme, Rethinking Indian Cities, to share their perspectives on various urban themes like economy, migrant workers, mobility, services, ecology, and governance. The series is an integral part of and feeds into the initiative launched last year called CTUD, Citizens Urban Initiative, which is a multi-level and multidisciplinary societal effort spearheaded by leading professionals, thinkers, and practitioners to work on a blueprint of productive, livable, and human urban future. Affordable shelter has assumed enormous significance in the context of massive setback experienced by the urban poor and low-income communities in our cities. Every state in India has an affordable urban housing policy. These are sought to be implemented through various actors, urban local bodies, parastatals, and private sector. The country now have, has a national policy for rental housing. However, it's not clear if the policy is framed on the basis of any evaluation of the earlier rental housing efforts in different states. The affordable housing policies in majority of the states are conceived in a absolutely top-down manner and focus primarily on the number of units constructed there is hardly any evidence-based approach to the concerns about quality of life of the urban poor, connections with places of work, mobility, access to public open spaces, and basic services. The Secretary General of United Nations, Antonio Guterres, last year during the pandemic, emphasized on greater multilateral cooperation and called for a new social contract for a new era to fight this pandemic of inequality. National and state recovery strategies need to factor in the pandemic's urban dimension in the affordable housing strategy. Cities of different sizes and housing for urban poor are indeed on the front lines of coping with the pandemic and lingering impacts on lives and livelihoods. There is an urgent need to empower the cities to respond to the COVID-19 crisis and potential future pandemics to new social contracts in affordable housing by focusing on building greater resiliency and inclusivity through creation of responsive institutions and participatory planning and governance for implementing sustainable development goals and the new urban agenda. The webinar is designed to initiate a dialogue in that direction by engaging with an esteemed panel of speakers. The conversation will be conducted by eminent architect, Mr. Ashok Lal, who has vast experience in alternative methods and practices in architecture in the country, and perhaps needs no further introduction. May I now request Ashok Ji, Mr. Ashok Lal, to kindly take the conversation forward. You are on mute. Now I'm not on mute. 
Now you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. So, well, thank you so much, Dominic. Uh, you have actually laid out the background, the context of the discussion that I thought I'd have with people with who bring different perspectives onto this issue of delivering affordable shelter, particularly in our cities. Um, just to introduce the panelists to you briefly, uh, let me first introduce to you Alpana Mitra. Hello, Alpana, are you there? Yeah. Are no, you there? Sir, she'll be joining uh, late, late, late. All right, so we'll wait for her to join. But Alpana Mitra is the chief engineer in charge of housing in Rajkot city on behalf of the, uh, she's a chief engineer in the Rajkot Municipal Corporation. And Rajkot is one of those cities that has promised that it will move towards a slum free city in a decade or two decades at the most. That's the ambition. And they have, they have had a very ambitious um, plan for providing affordable shelter uh, to those who are not adequately housed at present, and also to plan for those who would be coming to this very you know, vibrant industrial town with plenty of employment opportunities. So it'd be very interesting to hear the experience so far of having actually implemented a number of uh, social housing and affordable housing programs. That's Alpana. Um, then we have Hussein in Dorwala, who is an academic and has spent many years actually studying in great depth um, the city of Bombay and its historical attempts at uh, you know, providing affordable housing. But there seem to be some structural deficiencies in all the institutional structures and frameworks that the city has devised. And so he can give us some insights into what those things are that are coming in the way. Time and again, there are many promises, but nothing seems to actually happen on the ground. And at the same time, he would like to offer a possible alternative and how you can actually find a way for providing an institutional structure that can suffice, that would be a proper service for those who are most in need, people who want to upgrade themselves from current lives in very poor slum conditions. Then we have Vidhi. Vidhi Garg is a consultant who has been working in the housing field for many years uh, as a consultant, and she has studied it internationally. She had been recently in, in Europe, uh, uh, in, in the Netherlands, and she is quite conversant with the different kinds of institutional frameworks that have been uh, uh, that have been developed in different parts of the world, particularly the developed world, but elsewhere too. And so she brings in a certain, you know, a, 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 a perspective which reflects on what are the what are the kinds of structures that actually deliver the kind of affordable housing you need. So she'll be able to throw some light from that perspective. And we have Amor Cole. Amor is an architect, um, but became an environmentalist. And um, he, he has then worked for quite a few years now with a housing finance agency that has been trying to support um, small developers in different parts of the country. Uh, but the support has come with a certain conditionality. The support has come with the conditionality that you will produce what are called green buildings, right? They, that should be measured as green. And so he has a very interesting uh, experience in trying to promote this idea of at least sustainable, you know, green, sort of energy efficient, thermally appropriate, uh, water saving kind of structure, kind of, uh, kind of systems of building through the private development model. So that's our model. So this is a, the group that we have with us. Now to, to move on to this discussion really quickly, I would only say this, that 
the history of a migrant coming to a city. Um, notwithstanding the shock that everybody suffered because of COVID. But as that settles down, the return to the cities in one measure or the other is bound to start because that is where at the moment employment and opportunities are growing. Although it is happening more in the smaller towns, the second tier towns and the third tier towns as compared to the very large towns. So that's another very interesting fact. But what's happening is that the institutional frameworks um, under the PMAY, all its verticals, are not able to really find the appropriate mechanism through which the right kind of housing is provided. Um, and you know, we are wondering, we are just wondering, do we need to think about what institutional structures will work and what are the missing links in those institutional structures? Where can we fill them in? And how can we propose a policy for having the right institutional structures? So that's basically what we are talking about. And I'll start now. If Alpana Ji is there, if she if she's not there, uh, then I'll ask Hossein to join us and to give a few words about his finding about Bombay and his speculative thinking about the possible way of serving the demand for affordable housing. Hussein. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Lal, for uh, inviting me for this uh, discussion. Um, and uh, so what I thought uh, I, I would do is I would uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, very briefly about some of the questions of affordable housing in Bombay and then present a, um, a proposal that we had worked on uh, a few years ago, um, which was uh, meant to be an alternative uh, to the development plan process that was underway in Mumbai. Um, and to, uh, you know, because we were part of a civil society group who, who were intervening in the development plan making process. And uh, like all authorities, there was uh, um, grumbling about, uh, well, you guys only know how to criticize. Uh, why don't you propose alternatives? So we said, all right, we will take a particular area in the city and we will uh, try to think about uh, how um, uh, planning could be done in a way which is uh, uh, which kind of embodies the values that we were um, you know, trying to uh, emphasize as or in contrast to what the, uh, you know, the planning authority was doing. So this is uh, roughly what I intend to talk about. I'll share my presentation. Um, just let me know if you can see it. Um, is this uh, visible? Yes, it is. Okay, so um, uh, very quickly, um, how is, uh, existing affordable housing produced in Mumbai. Uh, this is in fact from one of the studies of the, um, of, uh, that led up to the development plan itself. And um, so this is uh, official data. Uh, and um, what that indicates, as you can see in this table, is that the uh, most affordable housing in Bombay actually is the informal settlement uh, uh, or houses produced through um, self-building. Um, in addition to that, there are older chawls, uh, which are rent controlled. Uh, there are slum rehab units, which uh, are initially um, allotted to uh, slum dwellers uh, free, but then after a point, uh, uh, slum dwellers can actually uh, sell them as well. Um, and then there's the EWS LIG component of uh, Mahara's uh, public housing. So this according to um, the development plan itself are the existing forms of affordable housing. Everything that is produced otherwise, whether it's uh, MIG, uh, formal public housing, or uh, private, uh, you know, through private uh, developers, uh, is, um, does not fall within the affordable housing category. Now, a large part of the uh, focus has been, at, at least from the perspective of the state, has been to try to make this bottom, um, you know, 30% uh, uh, deliver what the top 70% uh, already does. Uh, and this is, uh, so the, you know, the, the terms of the discussion are more about how can um, market actors uh, actually produce affordable housing 
and to think about all kinds of incentives, uh, subsidies, uh, uh, perks, uh, and so on to the uh, to market actors to be able to deliver affordable housing. And that is where most of the effort of the state is focused rather than focusing on how can one improve the conditions of uh, uh, already existing affordable housing in the city. Um, this is another chart. M Mumbai has very poor income-based uh, data. Uh, so this was one, uh, uh, you know, uh, one report, uh, World Bank report, which, uh, you know, had some kind of an indication of uh, uh, income-based uh, uh, data on Mumbai, and which is uh, quite revealing because it says that the first and second quintile of the population would actually and need uh, access to housing within 10 lakh rupees uh, and uh, the uh, from 50 percent to 91 percent that's so almost 91 percent of mumbai would uh, consider 30 lakhs or less as affordable housing uh, however in the city proper in mumbai city proper greater mumbai um, there's almost nowhere that a house can be produced uh, within 30 lakh rupees so that is basically the reality of the city now, where is the shortage of affordable housing? Um, and there are various uh, government reports which talk about this too, uh, in, in a lot of detail. The Kundu committee report spoke about 95% of the demand being uh, uh, in uh, EWS and LIG households. However, if you look at the Mumbai development plan, the way in which they bifurcate the housing demand for affordable housing is based on 35, 35, 30, uh, which is, uh, you know, which is uh, uh, very uh, odd. But uh, what is also interesting about this is that their definition of affordable is not based on, um, um, you know, income, but it is based on the house size. So if you build a 350 square feet house, no matter where it is, it is uh, technically affordable, according to the uh, according to Mumbai's planners, which is uh, uh, quite revealing about the, uh, in terms of the mindset of the planning authority. So this is the Malwani region of Mumbai. It is in the northwestern suburbs. And this is how the development plan prepared the existing land use map. And these large brown patches that you can see are actually the, uh, you know, uh, what are called slum settlements. Um, and the uh, expectation is that these are eventually going to redevelop under the slum rehabilitation scheme or something like that. And so um, the way in which the, the mapping is done uh, is also extremely broad brushed. Uh, in fact, uh, there is very little effort to map uh, social infrastructure within the informal settlements, the street networks, the, uh, you know, the housing types. Um, none of that is, uh, um, uh, you know, documented. Um, but uh, it is mapped in a way that uh, simply uh, indicates that these areas are eventually going to redevelop. Um, also, importantly, the way in which the slum is defined in the development plan is very odd. Um, the slum is uh, mentioned as a category of housing, um, but as everybody understands, um, slum is a condition. It is not a land use. However, uh, slums are mapped as a land use in land use plans. So that's uh, also uh, quite uh, some, I mean, something that uh, a lot of us uh, were critical about. So when we did this uh, study, which was uh, called the Malvani People's Plan, it was based on um, extensive interviews with uh, various communities in, this, in, uh, in the Malvani area. Uh, and uh, the first thing that we did was we did field surveys to uh, prepare our own land use, existing land use map. And uh, as you can see, uh, we, um, uh, did, we eliminated the uh, slum as a land use category. Uh, in fact, we went by technically what should be uh, considered land use and identified the, you know, the various industrial units within the settlements, the commercial the land uses, uh, amenities, street networks. All of that was uh, carefully documented and mapped as part of this uh, process. What we also did was we identified the various communities, self-identified communities uh, in the settlement and, um, uh, uh, and, and to, to, to kind of begin uh, to, uh, uh, the study itself. Um, Malvani is a very interesting settlement because it's extremely diverse. It has old resettlement housing. 
which was basically during the emergency, a lot of people from South Bombay were kicked out and resettled in the peripheries in these, uh, you know, the, the, the square, uh, um, the, the, the grid uh, that you can see on this map is actually the resettlement housing. It has over time grown and become extremely congested. Then you also see um, the various uh, site and services schemes uh, built in the, in the 70s and 80s. There's a large public housing area where you have EWS and LIG housing, um, as well as some uh, MIG housing. And then there are various pockets of uh, informal settlements. So uh, it's an extremely diverse area, um, which is, I mean, uh, which is which was also uh, something which uh, which uh, was an interesting test case for uh, for a uh, you know for a uh, plan like this. Um, and then when we after we identified the self, the various communities, we um, you know tried to understand land ownerships, uh, the conditions of the various settlements, uh, tenure patterns, which were very important because land ownership would uh, uh, affect the way in which uh, settlements could. Uh, eventually the entitlements, um, you know, and the various kinds of uh, uh, agencies involved and so forth. Um, we then, um, I, uh, you know, try, uh, uh, through these focus group discussions with communities, we identified priorities. And what we recognized uh, quite uh, immediately was uh, communities who had secure land tenure um, were not worried so much about shelter, but they were worried more about services. Whereas on the other hand, communities which that had very poor access to, um, uh, had no tenure, uh, for them, uh, shelter was the main priority. So there was internal, a lot of internal diversity among settlements as well, something that uh, uh, existing policy fails to recognize. What we then did was um, mapped uh, the various kinds of uh, services within the areas in terms of uh, solid waste management, uh, street conditions, uh, water supply, sanitation, um, existing uh, social infrastructure and so on. Um, and based on that, uh, we then uh, carried out analyses of uh, uh, what was going on. Um, we also documented various kinds of housing typologies uh, that were already existing on site. And these comparative studies of housing types revealed quite interesting things. For instance, the efficiency of various housing types vis-a-vis -vis others. Uh, so for instance, uh, informal settlements are very efficient as a housing type. Uh, on the other hand, apartments are not, you know, um, because they take up uh, too much land to produce uh, too little housing. Um, bungalow types are the least efficient and so on. So, you know, these comparatives also um, helped us uh, to uh, understand which uh, kind of housing uh, type would be most uh, uh, efficient in terms of land use, uh, land utilization, to release more areas for common use and community use and so on. And then these were, uh, these are some images of the proposition, the proposals, which were based on uh, uh, amenity allocation, uh, public transport, we also kind of uh, designed bus routes uh, based on um, access uh, to improve access uh, in, the, in the settlements, um, uh, livelihood uh, um, uh, opportunities, uh, how those could be created. And then we prepared our own proposed land use plan as an alternative to the development plan. And as you could see, this, this is the existing land use and the proposed land use. The, the, um, the effort was really, we had, when we began this uh, study, we had uh, three or four main objectives. One of them was to um, uh, make uh, do planning in a way that is least disruptive uh, and also creates almost no displacement. That was what the most important goal. Uh, the other one was uh, the other goals were improvement of uh, living conditions quantitatively as well as qualitatively improving access to social infrastructure and uh, opportunities, uh, as well as improving environmental safety. And these were the uh, goals which actually defined the process, as opposed to the goals uh, generally of the development planning process, which is to, uh, you, you know, um, in, in, in increase land values, uh, to uh, make uh, projects viable for uh, private sector actors and so on. Um, in terms, when we come to the housing proposals, one thing that we recognized uh, quite uh, soon was that um, the existing housing types are based on 
you know, the, 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 there are certain kind of remnants of the garden city ideal that is a compound and a garden and then there's a house in the garden, uh, which is, a, of course, a secure kind of a uh, uh, private uh, enclave. Uh, whereas what we recognized was uh, if we think of what we call the free layout typology, where there is an, um, there is an open space which is uh, highly interconnected, and within it, you have uh, dwelling units, um, which are uh, formal, but they are also, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, walk-up apartments, uh, high density, but uh, low, um, me medium rise or low rise, rather than high rise, low density, the kind that we see, or high rise, high density, which is the existing type for um, informal settlements, uh, redevelopments of informal settlements. This was uh, some of the um, uh, methods of how these blocks could be consolidated and uh, uh, improved over time. You recognize the residential block, uh, cut out the existing community open spaces which are there on site, and then um, you know uh, try to organize the buildings around them so that there is a memory of uh, uh, existing infrastructure that remains even after the settlement has transformed, which is also done over time in a cooperative manner rather than you know, uh, through um, uh, various agencies and so forth. There was another, uh, in some settlements where uh, there was secure tenure, the focus was more on improvements of conditions, which we call street schemes, where you um, uh, simply release more street space and stack above uh, the existing units to create more uh, open community and uh, amenity spaces. Um, and then this was uh, an example of reconstruction where you take the existing morphology of the settlement and uh, improve it over time. But again, this happens in small groups of 50 households or uh, 50 to 100 households rather than a large project which involves uh, thousands or tens of thousands of uh, 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 production of tens of thousands of units. Um, this was some of the uh, types that we speculated can emerge. So if you can see in the bottom with the three circles, these are the existing conditions. And these, over time, as the houses have grown, streets have become narrower. Um, the state regulations restrict going above ground plus one, which uh, actually leads to um, uh, you know, uh, further taking over of uh, open and shared spaces. So what we proposed was the regulations be revised to allow ground plus two, ground plus three, so that these uh, common spaces can be opened up and create more uh, common facilities uh, uh, and uh, social infrastructure. Uh, this was some of the um, design ideas which emerged out of this process. Um, and quantitatively speaking, if you look at the top right hand, uh, um, uh, right -hand side bar chart, uh, the existing settlement is fairly adequate in terms of uh, private residential areas. People have over time um, managed to secure about five square meters of private residential space for themselves, whether formal or uh, unauthorized. Um, but what we uh, aim to do through this project was actually increase the uh, public uh, uh, amenities and commons, which is, uh, which is what we managed to achieve through this uh, um, exercise of uh, planned upgradation, as we call it. Um, we also formulated development control rules for settlement upgradation and how they would look so that it's not only about um, the, the master plan, but it's also about the regulatory framework. Um, and then we had, uh, so we identified these settlements as uh, special zones of social interest, a, a term that is borrowed from the Latin American context. Um, and the, the DCRs would include specific recommendations for various kinds of services uh, and so on. And this would be how the uh, institutional structure would look like. There would be, within every settlement, there would be uh, a planning cell, which is linked to the municipal corporation, because after all, uh, the, uh, the services, provision of services are municipal responsibility. Um, and um, there would be, uh, within it, the possibility of uh, households or um, uh, uh, neighborhoods or communities to approach this planning cell and ask for improvements in water sanitation and, 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 and such services. And then there would be an expansion of uh, these uh, municipal uh, facilities and amenities within the settlement. So rather than thinking of everything, so it's kind of borrowing from the uh, Patrick Geddes method of um, building on what already exists, which is uh, worth preserving. 
and improving what needs to uh, needs to be improved basically so um, the overall um, uh, 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 um, method of doing this entire study was to basically first use land efficiently um, make the best use of land available by but not in the economic sense of the term in the in the in, in, you know in, in the um, spatial sense of the term that you um, can go a little higher um, which improves conditions but also releases uh, enough uh, open area shared uh, area for uh, communities, which is something that is efficient. Um, the uh, approach was cooperative self-help as opposed to um, uh, bureaucracies and, uh, um, uh, and market actors and their interventions. And finally, the approach was to improve public goods and public services within existing settlements, rather than thinking about these settlements as simply uh, something that needs to completely transform to become, um, uh, you know, uh, viable as living spaces. So this was, uh, yeah, the uh, study, and uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Hello. Are you sure, sir? So we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear All you. Right. Yeah, great, great. So two main things that I want to flag in what we have heard uh, from um, Hussein. First is that the kind of sensitivity comprehensiveness um, that is that is the response to the reality of what we might call a culture of housing as against the provision of you know structures which can be you know, which which can be uh, which which can be provided for people to you know to find some kind of sheltering the culture of housing requires a very elaborate framework and enormous detailed and expert activity at the ground. Now, this is completely beyond any governmental system. They don't have anything like this at all. So that's on the one side. The other side is that the, the assumption in Hussein's presentation is that there will be a bankable proposition which can arise out of this kind of formulation of progressive uh, improvement of uh, housing areas which are fallen into degradation. That this could become a bankable proposition and therefore uh, he's assuming or this, the, the proposal is assuming that yes, the financing mechanism can be found. On the other side, the government, um, you know, just wants, a, wants, wants an easy way out. They think that only the money bags who want more money out of land have the handle on any kind of financing solution. So you have to find a housing solution through the operation of those people who've got lots of money the big developer. And then they're able to transfer all the responsibility of development, uh, you know, the surveys, the getting the approvals from 70% of the households for redevelopment, et cetera, temporary housing, blah, 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 the whole works, transfer the entire responsibility to, uh, to the developer. Uh, and the objective is nothing more then one pakka house measuring up to 29, 30, 35 square meters, no matter in what form, in what manner, just the pakka house, nothing else counts, just the pakka house, delivering of that as the solution to the housing problem. 
So, you know, there's a sharp contrast. Um, so you, how does one see such, you know, that gap of what is actually needing, needed being filled? Who's going to do that? Who are the people? Is it going to be civil society? Is it going to be young professionals? It'll be new companies? Or will it be wings of municipal corporations? Who's going to do that? So I'm just going to leave that question for us to discuss a little later. If now uh, Alpana ji is with us, are you with us now, Alpana ji? No. No, oh dear, what a pity. <laughs> so let, let me move on to Vidhi. Um, Vidhi, from my cursory knowledge of the what they're called, they, they're called housing corporations in the Netherlands, right? And similar organizations in other parts of Europe. Um, from my cursory knowledge of that, uh, one sees that the traditional business community and civil society comes together to make a, a process for providing affordable shelter to those who need it most in the city. Um, over a period of time, as this movement gains strength, this is supported by the state, and not only supported by the state, the state exchequer guarantees the financial stability or financial support for all operations of these uh, corporations. And it is with that kind of integration from the ground through civil society and professionals to the state that the entire social housing program is built. Um, so Vidhi, can you throw some more light on you know, what is the structure of such institutional frameworks and what might be the potential of bringing similar frameworks in for our needs here in India? Yes, Vidhi? thanks Ashu. Yes, thanks so much Ashokji and thanks Kirtiji and Inha for having me here. Um, Ashokji, I think you've really laid the uh, framework, really the foundation really well. Um, I will be presenting the case studies from the Netherlands, Netherlands and Austria today, um, and I'll try to do it justice in the 10 minutes that I have. Um, as Ashokji said, I've structured this uh, presentation really to answer the question of what are the institutional and the financial structures, what are the processes, who are the actors to help us, you know, to get from the, to translate the intention of the policy into affordable shelter in communities. Uh, and I've done that both for the Netherlands and Austria. Uh, before I dive into that, I just want to give some quick background. Um, of course, as we all know that, you know, post-World War II, there was an intense reconstruction period in uh, all European, in most European countries, Western European countries. And, um, and, and that's when a lot of social housing was built. Uh, I think what sets Netherlands and Austria apart from most of these uh, uh, other European countries, not all but most, is that the foundation for their social housing systems, as we know it today, was actually laid around World War I or after World War I. Uh, and so in the Netherlands, in fact, the Housing Act, which was passed in 1901, was the first official government sort of intervention uh, and involvement in the social housing sector. And in Vienna, it was after World War I uh, for a period of about 15 years, uh, which was called Red Vienna, actually, when the Socialist Democratic Party came to power and for whom social housing was, was a key component of, of the work that they were doing. Um, and, and so when these, uh, for in both countries, in the Netherlands and Austria, when these social housing systems initially started, they were led purely by government, by local government. Uh, there was devolution of power to the local government. Uh, so the implementation, the construction, the management, all of that was carried out by the local governments. Uh, and much like other European countries, there was the bulk of social housing was built in the post-World War II period, in the three decades following World War II. Um, in the 1980s is about when the winds started to change and 
instead of, you know, where the government said, we've done what we need to do, and we're going to take a step back, we're going to play a supportive role, and instead let private sector organizations come in and build housing, build and manage housing. And that's what Ashok Ji said, are called housing corporations or housing associations. And this happened both in the Netherlands and Austria. One key difference is that, in, and we'll come to this later as well, in Austria, yes, limited, what they call limited profit housing associations, LPHAs, uh, since the 1980s have led housing uh, provision uh, very much, you know, very closely with working very closely with local government um, as well. Uh, but, yeah, but in the Netherlands, it's the, uh, the housing associations got complete financial and administrative independence starting in 95. And again, they do work closely with local government, as we'll see, uh, but uh, there is no financial support um, except for a guarantee from the government, uh, unlike in Austria, where the government does provide low interest public uh, loans as well. Uh, and I've just put these little thumbnails of images. I realize they're pretty tiny, but the idea is to just show you a snapshot of, you know, the language, the change in the architecture of social housing over time and how it really reflected uh, also what was going on by and large. Uh, so in the Netherlands, this, by the way, is a picture of the Hedgekip housing project and museum, which is also, which also houses a museum actually in Amsterdam. This was built around the 1920s um, and is really emblematic of the Amsterdam School of Architecture. Um, so some of the key features of social housing in the Netherlands, uh, one, like I said, is that at the helm, at the forefront of social housing provision are housing associations that are private and nonprofit entities. Uh, they, uh, their activities are very closely regulated. Uh, they work within a framework of national laws and regulations. Um, but the government is, like I said, playing only an enabling role. Uh, the national government sets the policies and the regulations. It's also responsible for oversight, including financial oversight of housing associations activities uh, and municipalities work with uh, and housing association at the local level, they do work with uh, the municipalities. Uh, I think this is something that Dr. Roy said early on and, and Ashokji said as well is, uh, and this is something that really sets uh, both Austria and the Netherlands apart, is that the focus is not just on, you know, delivering one pakka house. It's not just on the quantitative aspect. And this is right from the beginning is, you know, focusing on the qualitative aspects of housing as well, recognizing that a home or a house is not, doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? And so you have to build livable communities, livable neighborhoods. What are the amenities? What does it take to build those livable neighborhoods? Um, and finally, coming to the financing piece of it um, and again I'll go into some detail later but uh, it, the interesting thing is it's a closed loop financing system so what it what that means is that all of the revenues that a housing association makes have to be plowed back into the social housing sector for development of new housing and for maintenance of existing housing, uh, which, which helps to establish uh, long-term financial sustainability as well. So speaking of the institutional structure, um, like I said, you know, the central government is, you know, since the 90s uh, in the Netherlands has really been in, in the background where they're setting the overall regulatory and legal framework. Um, and th that includes a lot of different things. I've just bulleted a few here. Um, I, I do want to point out specifically the SGEI versus the non-SGEI. SGEI means services of general economic interest. And so that, and that's really the focus for housing associations. And that includes social housing uh, development and management, but also any associated amenities or uh, uses that, that, that will help improve neighborhood character and quality of life. Uh, and uh, uh, housing associations are allowed to engage in some commercial activities, which are classified as non-SGEI, uh, but they are, you know, there's a very clear sort of firewall between those two uh, and the very strict regulations as to how much of it uh, they can do to prevent, to prevent mission drift um, and things like that. Um, in addition to that, the national regulatory framework also uh, includes rules around the targeting of social housing, which used to be really broad, but in 
in the last decade or a little more than a decade has started to now be, be much more narrowly focused on low income and vulnerable populations. It also talks about allocation, rent setting. There are annual, annually the government uh, revises both the minimum and the maximum rent amounts that can be charged for social housing. Uh, and then of course the financing as well. And then, like I said, the second thing that the government is responsible for, the Housing Association Authority is responsible for oversight of the different housing associations individually, but as a group as well. Uh, and finally, uh, there's a three-tier financial guarantee system, uh, which is backstopped, uh, which actually is, is called the so, uh, Social Housing Guarantee Fund. WSW is the acronym in Dutch. I wouldn't be able to tell you what it stands for in Dutch, but uh, it's uh, basically a fund that housing associations pay into um, and then is backed up by um, uh, the central and local <coughs> governments as well. Um, and then, so with the central government setting the stage, setting the framework for all of this, uh, the, it's, it's devolved to the local level. There's this understanding, obviously, that, you know, real estate and housing is just a very local business. Um, so, you know, you need municipalities, you need the housing associations to work at those at that local level. And they work together with tenant organizations, and this is actually called the local triangle. Uh, and, and they work very closely with each other to, to set their goals you know what is the both in terms of quality and quantity types of social housing uh, timelines um, also other amenities if there are any priorities uh, in either in terms of targeting or otherwise and these are called performance agreements and these are multi-year performance agreements that are signed uh, at the local level between these institutions um, and to, to guide social housing development over you know whatever period uh, and then of course they are updated uh, and, you know, the, as we'll see also in Aust Austria, there's a very clear sort of division of responsibilities, recognizing and harnessing the strengths of these different stakeholders. Uh, you know, we've seen time and again that government is not the best entity to build and to design and build and manage housing, uh, social housing. So, so let's, you know, which is why you've got these housing associ associations in the picture. They are the ones who are responsible for the planning and the design, the construction, even the allocation, all of them within the whole regulatory framework, which is set by the government. Um, and uh, there is an equ equity contribution uh, by the housing associations. There is skin in the game uh, and there is private debt. There's no public debt in uh, the Netherlands. Um, and another very important uh, feature also in Austria is the focus on operations and maintenance is that, you know, it's not just about building and delivering the house and being done with it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, any building, uh, any use requires constant TLC. Uh, and, you know, that is baked into, in, in fact, the, the rental prices as well. Um, so that's really important. Uh, this is a map, which is from the city of Amsterdam's website, just showing the distribution of housing association properties in the Amsterdam metropolitan region. And it's the different colors show the different housing, uh, represent the different housing associations. And it's not, you know, it's it's fairly well distributed. Um, it does show, uh, you know, if you look at it, there are some concentrations here in the north, in the new west, and here in the southeast, and those actually align with how the city has grown over time, and the city has identified different like, as it's growing outwards to identify new areas for development um, and social housing development. Uh, I've got some pictures that I'll go through pretty quickly, but this is really over time, just to show you the evolution of the architecture architecture or in social housing in Amsterdam. Uh, so this is Zahnhof uh, built, uh, it's in the west of the city, built right after World War I. Uh, and, and you can see it's a pretty sort of small scale, um, low rise, but high density. Uh, it's got two concentric rings uh, of housing and a little courtyard uh, in the middle, you know, human scale used uh, by children, includes a playground uh, and, and used by children and, and adults alike. This was built after World War II, uh, it, you know, that big post-construction, uh, post-World War II reconstruction uh, phase in the 1970s. Again, you can see the scale of this project. Very different, um, very big, large open spaces, 
often not used uh, and, and actually uh, faced a lot of criticism and there was some uh, demolition and reconstruction. Uh, you can see the picture on the right, which shows a part of that project that was rebuilt, much, much different scale, much more human, much more usable common spaces as well. And this is something from the early 2000s, which is a mixed income development in the eastern part of the city. Uh, the social housing building, it's, it's a long ribbon building. This is the one on the left and on the right is a market rate uh, has, uh, building in the same complex. Uh, switching over to Austria, uh, much like uh, the Netherlands, there is uh, it, it is led by what we call limited profit housing associations, uh, but working very closely with uh, the public sector again um, to, to, to devise plans, uh, multi-year plans. Um, unlike uh, the Netherlands, there is public, significant public financing uh, for social housing development in Austria. Uh, there's a mix of both public and private uh, debt. It, it, uh, and again, we'll get to that in a little bit. Similar to the Netherlands, it is a closed loop financing system. So once again, the housing associations are required to uh, reinvest their revenues into the social housing sector um, and the even the public loans that are repaid are recycled back into the sector. Um, so, uh, which, is obviously, which obviously goes a very long way. Um, social housing, again, uh, is, is that it goes far beyond the quantitative aspect. You know, there's this recognition that we need to integrate it with the rest of the city, with the infrastructure. Uh, and so there, are, I think it's every 10 years that the city council adopts a city development plan and land use plans, uh, which are prepared in consultation with a whole lot of different stakeholders, uh, including residents and communities themselves. Uh, and social housing is very much integrated within the plans and in fact I think they even go right down to the parcel level to define what's to be built on each parcel um, and then finally uh, you know there's again very high quality uh, uh, of, of development and one of the reasons for that is this competitive process uh, to select the LPHAs for housing development. Uh, and they're actually judged on by a multidisciplinary jury. So the city actually, based on the city development plan, will acquire the parcels of land for social housing and then sell them to the selected developer at an affordable price. And uh, so it solicits proposals from a number of developers. And uh, a multidisciplinary jury judges them based on four criteria, the, the architectural design, the social sustainability, the economic sustainability, and the environmental sustainability of the plans. Uh, and developers actually have to commit to the economic plan, uh, otherwise they lose their subsidies. Uh, so speak getting to the institutional structure in Austria um, uh, policy making is devolved to the provincial level so the provincial government is very closely uh, is the one that sets housing policy Vienna is a little bit of a different beast because it's a city and a province uh, and it's a metropolitan area uh, the city uh, as so the city and the housing associations are the ones that work very closely with each other um, like I said it's the city that prepares these city development land use plans. Um, in addition, they also provide low interest public loans, generally at about 1%, um, and as compared to private debt, which is at 2.5%. Um, and these are long term, so I think they're about 40, anywhere between 30 to 40 years. Um, and then of course, they also provide some grants, which may account for around 5% of total project costs. Uh, like I said, they sell land in, at an affordable price, um, and they, uh, the city of Vienna, just to give you some numbers, uh, owns around 220,000 social housing units that were built before the 1980s, and it still owns and maintains them. Um, and uh, so, so, so they are involved in operations and maintenance as well. The housing associations, as I said, are responsible for raising both public and private debt. There's also an equity contribution from them, which generally accounts to amounts for around 5% of project costs, development costs. And finally, this is interesting, is that uh, tenants also make a down payment, uh, which is usually capped at 12.5% of project cost, I think. Um, if I'm not mistaken, and, uh, and it accounts for around 5% uh, 
of total development costs. Uh, and the idea is it, it just gives the developer upfront capital to build and it's repaid to the tenant when they move out with interest. Um, again, just a few pictures. Um, like I said, uh, in the decade uh, between World War I and II was when there was a lot of construction of social housing. This is one of those large projects. Um, they were usually centered around a courtyard or multiple courtyards um, and, uh, and included a lot of non-residential users as well. So actually the picture on the right is the approach to the laundry in, in this particular project. Um, this is, a, this is a much larger project built in the 1970s, uh, which is southwest of the city center. Uh, this has about 3,000 units. Uh, and uh, once again, you know, the idea that it's not just housing, we have to, you know, there has to be enough community amenities, etc. Um, so it, you may or may not be able to see it, but actually swimming pools on the top of some of these buildings. Uh, there are multi-purpose rooms, gyms, uh, of course, as you can see on the right, playgrounds, little playgrounds all over the, the property. Um, so this is very, very, in very short, but I, I did want to sort of, you know, highlight some of the things that are common to both the Netherlands and Austria um, and uh, what I think are points for discussion. Uh, of course, one of the big things is that the major is uh, the first thing that stands out is that social housing provision is not led by government. Government is only in a supportive role, but it's really these specialized private nonprofit entities that have the technical and the financial capacity to design, to build, to manage um, affordable uh, social housing over an extended period of time. Uh, at the same time, there's close cooperation between the public and the private sectors because there's a recognition that, you know, no one sector can do it by themselves. Uh, so how do we again harness the strengths of the two and, and bring the two together? Uh, to work together and 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 reach the ultimate goal. Uh, thirdly, again, like we've talked about earlier, is there's a very explicit focus on quality and on you know, and that includes social, economic, and environmental sustainability. This is right from the planning phase of the project, and it's throughout the project life cycle. Uh, you know, right. Uh, not just uh, at offtake, but goes beyond that to property maintenance, uh, large scale repairs, periodic large scale repairs as well. Uh, and that's reflected in, in fact, that a component of the rent is, it, it goes specifically towards operations and maintenance. Uh, and finally, the revolving fund to finance social housing development continuously uh, to make sure, you know, where the revenue is reinvested back into the sector uh, to ensure long-term sustainability. So that's it from me. I'm going to end here. Um, thanks again, everyone. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Ashok ji, we can't hear you. No, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah? Yes, yeah. sir. Okay, so um, once again, I'd like to just bring out a couple of things from your very extensive and very well structured explanation of how these, um, these social housing institutions in Austria and the Netherlands work. The first is that these institutions, which are non-profit or limited profit institutions whose is activities devoted to social housing. The question in my mind is, how, how are they born? What do they come out of? Uh, these are, where do these people come from? They're not from government. They're not the business community. They're not real estate, but they are a service community, highly professionalized and very dedicated to service. But they are subjected to both legal and financial discipline under the state laws. How do these entities come about? It seems to be, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm just, I keep wondering, why don't we have any such entities in our part of the world? Or do we have? Maybe we do. I don't see them. Um, the second thing was that it was clear if you look at the map of Amsterdam with the distribution of, of social housing 
developments across the city. Um, land, which is dedicated or defined or, or uh, in, in the planning system, the local planning system, if land is once taken up for social housing, then its valuation as you know, as a as a financing instrument, valuation of land, how much you should charge, and what you know, I don't know what the exact financing mechanisms are, but the valuation is taken outside the free real estate market. There is some other principle that works on valuing this land so that the product becomes affordable. And of course, the third thing is that primarily these are all rental housing. This is not housing for sale. Um, so um, I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering um, in, in, our, in our situation, we don't, we don't have the professional units of the, nat of the nature that Hussein was describing in his exercise that you know, they had done as a speculative exercise working with the community. The professional nature of that, we don't have those units. On the other hand, we don't have the institutions like the housing association um, in India. And I, I believe that both of these are absolutely essential to be able to deliver affordable shelter in a proper manner. But let me now just turn to Amor. Amor, you're there? Yes, sir, I'm here. Yeah. So Amor, from, from your perspective, um, you know, trying to push um, environmental performance for affordable housing projects through private real estate financing, right? Uh, it seems that, you know, uh, now many of the funds that are coming to finance housing in India especially affordable housing in India, those funds that are coming, they're coming yeah. with a rider that you get yeah. our fund, which you can distribute, you can lend monies to developers uh, um, who are developing housing, you can distribute money to them, provided yeah. you meet the green agenda. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What has been your experience on working in this situation? It's relatively new. It's just this, this thing is happening over the last three or four years only. Right, right. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, I'll, I'll just tell you, I mean, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a, a presentation to show, but I do have a story to tell. Uh, the story is about, uh, you know, how we started doing what we are doing and why we are doing. It. So we went, we went out and started giving uh, uh, these affordable housing uh, loans to uh, these developers, particularly developers, not, not particularly on the mortgage side. Uh, we found that these are small time developers and they are, they are actually creating a lot of footprint. So these probably, I mean, I know a couple of developers, those who are uh, first time developers, very low cost developers, and uh, they are making houses in numbers of 2,600, 3,000, 5,000 in units. So, this humongous number which is coming up. Uh, we try to establish that, you know, how, how do we really understand this? Because um, they are just making whatever they want to make. And uh, there is no architect involved because they are small time uh, developers. They are mostly family run businesses and uh, they might be having an engineer who will be doing everything for them. and. Uh, the most important aspect, which is getting the approvals from the authorities, uh, that is the only part where uh, uh, where an engineer or, a, or an architect is involved. Otherwise, everything is being done on the basis of whatever the developer or whatever that particular owner understands. And uh, these huge developments are coming. So we, we, we thought of the other first thought was how to create value and how to specifically understand the quality of life. Now, it is very, very critical to understand the quality of life. The quality of life for uh, is always subjective. You know, what, what we understand by the quality of life is 
uh, probably having a you know a big house and creating a, a better environment or uh, air quality or 24 what 24 hours water supply for someone like i've seen uh, you know these pictures from Hussein that you know the people are coming from uh, slums uh, uh, very dilapidated conditions uh, for them the quality of life is just a structure as as probably uh, you know what what uh, you said so that you know uh, 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 a pakka house is is you know that is that is a good enough uh, quality of life for these people but then we put everything with our standards we we want to put something at you know we 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 see things from a very different perspective from our perspective so the our perspective was to you know you know we need to have something like dlf what what dlf made so what what do we do we we instigated that you know why don't we attempt for a green building so uh, uh, green buildings basically provide a certain standard uh, to a development which meets uh, which meets minimum uh, quality of life as i say you know the thermal comforts and the and the quality of uh, construction and uh, the areas the landscape areas and uh, you know the open spaces parkings and all that uh, aspects of life which are covered water availability uh, that is where we came from and uh, we realized that uh, providing that to a development be it anything uh, will create some kind of uh, uh, some kind of ecosystem within the affordable housing uh, community which is driven by these small developers so again uh, i am i am again coming again and again for the small developers because these are the actual people right now who are building uh, under PMAY scheme. So uh, PMAY scheme provides a lot of incentives to the builder and to the banks, not particularly directly invested to the uh, user or consumer, but, but it does provide a lot of benefits to uh, a bank or, or sometimes a developer. So for an example in Gurgaon, uh, the land cost is discounted if you have if you if you go about for a uh, affordable housing scheme additionally you will get a 15% hike on far that is second um, of course whatever you make uh, the consumers will get um, uh, you know uh, pmay uh, that that uh, clss scheme that is your credit credit link uh, subsidy scheme uh, they will be benefited out of it uh, based on whatever that uh, base case that they have set up of uh, you know 60 square meters or rather I'll, I'll quote it from the uh, bank perspective it is 3 lakhs, 6 lakhs, 12 lakhs and 18 lakhs so that is the household income that we are talking about so 3 lakhs you will have uh, subsidy then you have 6 lakh that you have subsidy 12 lakhs is you have subsidy for MIG1 and then for uh, MIG2 it will be uh, uh, 18 lakhs. So now for last couple of years they have removed MIG1 and MIG2 but EWS and uh, LIG still exist. So that is how it has been uh, distributed in uh, in places like Gurgaon or, or, or in uh, Noida. Uh, so these developments have uh, you know these small time developers they have started growing so they finish one project and then they move to the next one now the biggest challenge that these developers and we have a lot of discussion that you know why don't you and mind you these these developments are like 20 floors 15 floors 25 floors 24 floors uh you know the density worth uh uh you know probably uh, 1600 houses uh, sorry 160 170 uh, dwelling units per uh, per acre so these are the kind of density that they are making so the question comes back that what kind of development are we really uh, uh, promoting uh, you are basically putting somebody from one slum to really to an effectively another slum because uh, 30 square meter area is not going to be uh, sufficient enough 
to a family of four no matter what you do but that is that is what is happening uh, for last two couple of years and uh, that is where we tried to intervene and we started you know we we use certain instruments of financial power uh, with with particularly with debt financing uh, and the, what we call as a construction finance to these developers giving them and telling them that if you want to go for a green or or or, or for a development you need certain assistance or a structure we are ready to give you that structure uh, probably uh, rebate in rate of interest to the developers not to the uh, uh, consumers but per se now with a condition that they are supposed to do the green buildings that is there as a base condition as well as you have to maintain environment and social governance standards or you know we we audit them we go to their sites we make sure that you know these standards are followed it's not only meant for the the design uh, which has been tackled at the first through a green building system but also uh, people those who are making them the laborers uh, i've been talking i mean i've i've heard a lot of talking about the quali- qualitative and quantitative numbers so uh, in india i don't think you can you can get away with the quantitative numbers because it is required it is need of the hour here you you just cannot wait and you you don't have that kind of land available at the first place and then even if the land is available i know for a for i mean for for a fact that a project which is launched um in the morning sold off by evening or by night or o'clock and we are talking about 800 units and it's been sold off so uh, the qualitative standards have to be maintained and uh, along with the quantitative you you just you you in india that is the major challenge that you know the numbers will be exaggerated the numbers will be overwhelming but then you have to make sure that the quality is also there so we started doing that we started meeting these developers we we started giving them the solutions we started giving them the structure so the structure is mostly based upon uh the design you submit a design if we approve if we agree you move to the next part then you get the next tranche of the payment and uh, that is how we divided the uh, structure wherever you need we will provide you that tranche and we'll make you uh, comfortable at the point uh, however uh, we are we are still in very initial phases and uh, this is one company's initiative so uh, and it's very small but but it's a but it's an initiative nonetheless and uh, policy wise there are no structures available for such kind of uh, you know uh, such kind of financial benefits specifically to the developers uh, sundrev program which is private uh, primarily driven by the nhb and uh, national housing bank and to 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 that uh, fact pmay is also been driven by nhb national housing bank now sundrev program is actually talking about if you have a green building certification from griha or from igbc you will get a certain kind of benefit uh, to your mortgage loans however those mortgage loans are uh, are uh, those those rois the rate of interest uh, is pretty much the same so it does not really benefits the end consumer it always benefits it somehow benefits the pli or what we call the primary lending institution and to date uh, apart from our company none have really claimed that sunref program Uh, out of uh, out of necessity pro- probably one of the biggest bank in india they have claimed it but that is out of necessity and be based out of you know the nhb said that it you have to take uh, it's only we that we have claimed that uh, mortgage loan but uh, i don't think that that kind of structure available and whenever we go outside i mean to to international finances uh, these dfis as we call it development financial institutions across the world uh they have one 
very serious question and we agree to it also that you are telling us that you know you are making a green building it is going to be sustainable it is going to be very effective show us uh, and unfortunately we don't have a story to tell on that side right now uh, the projects are under construction and uh, we are ensuring going on site making sure that you know these constructions are made according to the drawings according to the agreements according to the uh, whatever we have come whatever developer has committed and uh, uh, but still uh, the question remains the same that what will happen i mean uh, even we are equally scared to claim something from the dfis to allocate into the uh, into the structure because if we do that the account when the accountability comes uh, we don't have that much of control with the developer although the developer is listening to me because i'm funding them and everything but on the ground developer at the end of the day does what he wants to do and sometimes uh, it's almost impossible to uh, detect them and stop them and to uh, you know you, you cannot penalize them of course so that is that is that is the base story that we are doing and this is what we are trying to achieve right. to to yeah, meet well. the quality of life yes sir hello yes sir you are saying something We can't yeah, hear you. I was just saying that uh, we've got another, yeah. you know, another kind of a picture of what the reality on the ground is. Um, what we are saying is that the interest towards some sort of an interest towards quality is being driven by international financing institutions, uh, and those financing companies who take on those finances, those funds. And then they are required to press for at least the sustainability oriented agenda uh, in private development. Um, and that you could say is a little bit of a push towards some quality from the financing agency. But what we see is that so long as housing remains a marketable commodity or profit in real estate, uh, there is likely to be, there is likely to be always a conflict between the interests of the profiteer, the developer, and the interests, you know, and the best interest of what we think as civil society and designers um, should be offered in the name of housing. Um, and so once again, you can see there's a gap. This, 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 the structure of the entire system is not adequate for providing the, uh, the right kind or what, what we consider to be potentially the, the right kind of housing. Um, so I'm just going to, I, I don't know if Alpinaji is here with us. Is she here with us or still not with us? I, no, sir. She is okay. in a meeting in Oh dear. Well, you know that's one of the one of the hazards of being a government servant. Uh, you know who your boss is always, right? So you just have to attend to the boss first. No other commitment comes. Um, so let me let me go back and you know give each each one of the panelists a chance to respond to what they've heard. You know the three. Uh, from 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 all the all the panelists, and say how they would envisage the possibility of an institutional framework that you think is appropriate arising. What condition is required for that to arise? It cannot be it cannot be willed by anyone. It has to happen from certain some from some movement, some awareness. I'm coming together of professions and finance and government. So would you like to hazard a guess on how this can begin to happen, Hussein, in India? 
Yeah, no, uh, I was um, actually I found the uh, presentation uh, on Vienna and uh, Austria uh, quite fascinating. Um, the, the, it, I mean, we tend to talk about uh, the, his, the story of um, uh, housing in uh, in our context almost as though it's a completely different domain. Um, but actually, there are very interesting uh, parallels with the story of uh, uh, you know social housing or public housing in the West and here as well. I mean, post independence, uh, um, we did have. You know, I mean, actually, it was pre independence that the uh, that the early ideas of uh, public intervention and housing began in the city of Bombay. I speak from uh, Mumbai mainly, um, and. Uh, Post-independence, we did have the housing board set up, um, which is then later became MADA. Uh, and the role of MADA was envisioned as an agency which is going to carry out slum clearance, slum clearance scheme. Uh, but the slum clearance scheme, although it sounds uh, uh, um, prima facie very um, uh, only about clearing slums, the uh, condition was that slum clearance would be um, uh, would go hand in hand with uh, um, formal public housing. And this formal public housing was the responsibility of the housing board. There were budgetary allocations for uh, housing. Mara had um, you know, acquired a lot of land in the city to build public housing. It built a lot of housing and there is a great degree of expertise in Mara about how to do housing. Um, it is underappreciated, I must say. Um, because um, they really knew what they were doing, uh, although there are obviously problems uh, in terms of uh, who the housing eventually went to. They did not create as much uh, um, EWS housing as they did uh, LIG and much more MIG and so on. But still, um, that I mean, Mara did some very interesting housing in Bombay. Um, and like uh, in the West, uh, from the 80s onwards, uh, this was uh, this approach was completely delegitimized. Uh, the um, uh, the housing board was uh, uh, subjected to financial constraints. Um, public housing was defunded essentially. So today, Mahara operates almost like a developer, it, uh, a landowner rather, um, and involves uh, uh, you know developers gives them certain benefits, takes a share of the housing, uh, like any other agency, whether the SRA and so on, and now BMC wants to get into housing as well. Uh, and so, so there is a shift in the way in which housing is conceived, generally, um, as uh, mm. from moving from private public uh, good to something that is, uh, uh, you know, that is that has to be delivered to the marketplace. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to um, uh, talk about, uh, which you also mentioned, was the role of um, regulatory frameworks and planning interventions. Um, it, it, by, uh, uh, in, in cities, especially, um, the value of land is almost entirely dependent on what can be legally built on it. And um, a large part of the current thinking about housing is on how to um, change what can be legally built on land. And so, especially in Mumbai, slum rehabilitation is about displacing uh, housing for what they call higher and better uses, which is basically more profitable uses. So the, uh, the focus is more on um, uh, 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 transferring control from people who depend on land for, for their own use, for housing use, to people who seek the right to profit from land. And that is essentially the uh, way in which, uh, uh, which is the, the general framework within which all of the other problems are subordinated. So I think uh, that is um, yeah. uh, a concern. Mm. So I, I would think that uh, apart from thinking about, and a lot of uh, people in the housing sector today do talk about institutions for self-help and you know uh, improvement of living conditions, basic services, etc. But I think we need to more seriously think about uh, um, reviving the idea of housing as a public good as uh, um, yeah. uh, and the institutional yeah. framework for uh, thinking about um, how um, you know housing was done earlier. And you are right, uh, Professor Lal, that uh, even in Vienna and Austria, it's not that these uh, uh, approaches to housing came from, from a vacuum or the enlightened uh, uh, 
policy makers. Actually, it was um, you know decades of uh, working class movements which actually forced the state to undertake many of these. Uh, uh, created a kind of a cultural environment where uh, housing became a public responsibility. So I think uh, those are some of the things that are worth thinking about. Well, um, Vidhi, would you like to build upon that? Uh, I would like you to yeah, think, think specifically about the Indian scene. You've seen one kind of <laughs> a, a picture which was painted, you know, what, what uh, Hussein talked about earlier, or he's been telling you what's going on in, in, in the big cities. Um, you know, what, what I, I have come to this firm conviction that if the definition of the city is that it is, it is a space for profiteering from land by real estate, that is what a city is. And if that is the definition by which all development planning of city happens and all management of city land happens, then you are doomed to a divided city. You're doomed to a city uh, where half the people will not have access to legitimate and affordable land. And you're doomed to a city in which that half of people will be under great environmental stress. It is only when you can begin to think of a city as an instrument for the distribution of land and opportunity, the distribution of opportunity and wealth. If you can think of the process of the city development as serving that purpose, that you begin to think of taking land out of the speculative market. That seems to be an absolute prerequisite, without which nothing can happen. So Vidhi, over to you, your thoughts. Yeah, you're yeah, absolutely right, Ashokji. Uh, you know, and in fact, like just looking at the, even the two examples that I presented today, uh, there's actually a pretty like big, difference even between Vienna and Amsterdam, you know, where Amsterdam mm. uh, has in some sense uh, to, to, to quite an extent opened up its land and its city to speculation, you know, and mm. if you look at how social housing development has evolved just in the last 15 to 20 years, uh, comparing Amsterdam and Vienna, it's very different. You know, one of the things I think it's the someone in the city government of Vienna that says, just by looking at a house in Vienna or the location of where someone lives, you can't tell how much they earn, right? Mm -hmm. And they really pride themselves on it because 62% of the population, or 60 or 62% of the population actually lives in subsidized housing, whether it's you know, municipal housing or mm -hmm. housing association built housing. And, uh, you know, I, I think like Hussein, I completely agree with you, you know, social housing or affordable housing is never going to be the highest and best use of land, right? Um, uh, east, west, wherever we are. Um, and, and which is why, you know, and, and the, that government intervention is really, really important, and especially on the land piece. So even today, both in the Netherlands and Austria, the government does provide some its subsidy in some form or the other to housing associations to acquire land, right? They earmark the land, they sell it at a subsidized price, whatever it is. Um, and, and without that, and, you know, so absolutely right. Uh, Hussein, it's, it, uh, you know, even in the US for that matter, uh, the, there are the equivalent of housing associations. Um, and, and it was very much a community led bottom up sort of growth, right, a uh, very strong civil society. And that is something and, you know, I uh, disclaimer here, I've worked a little bit in India, but not very much, definitely not close to how much the rest of you have worked. Um, and, you know, I, I do think that there is, there are some similarities, there is a strong civil society in India as well. Um, and, you know, I think maybe I'm too optimistic, but I do think that there's hope for that to sort of, again, like grow upwards, you know, into this movement of, you know, and actually make the government sit up and take notice that there is, uh, you know, that, that there is a need for housing and that there, and then to build that capacity bottom up of these organizations uh, in the nonprofit sector, uh, because we've seen it being done before. It's not impossible. Um, you know, there are a few projects in India that I'm aware of as well that have been built like this. Um, South Africa actually has uh, to, to, you know, speak of another developing country. South Africa, in fact, uh, I think 
shortly after apartheid after the apartheid regime ended, instituted what they call the social housing institutions, and they have a social housing regulatory act, and it has to do with you know it. it of course, they haven't been able to build that capacity, but again, it's possible there are a few. Um, housing associations that do build and manage uh, social rental housing. And so can we learn? Uh, what can we do? Uh, I, I mean, I think it's very much possible in India, uh, but a lot of things need to change. Well, and I, for one, wouldn't uh, know where to start. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so what, what, what seems to be emerging is that the, the housing association, as you call it, um, is a kind of a model it is essentially initiative by civil society. And it is then, it is, it is, it is an institutional structure uh, which is devoted to a certain kind of specialized task. It has great capacities within it um, in all fronts, law, finance, management, design, social uh, interactions, uh, and operation and maintenance. All of that is built into these institutions, right? Uh, and then these are legally, by law, under law, recognized as special institutions for which special arrangements are then made, whether it is financing arrangements, legal arrangements, or arrangements vis-a-vis -vis -vis local city planning, making land available for providing housing where it is needed. Uh, that seems to me to be a kind of a model. And it comes back to this same point. Why is it that someone like me or people, so many people that I know who have been shouting about housing rights for so long have not set up a housing association and actually become housing entrepreneurs with not exactly a profit motive, but housing entrepreneurs with a, with let's say financial discipline, all right? Why is it not happened? Is my question. Amor, why has this not happened? I mean, you you are trying to push this kind of an idea through a financing institution, trying to right. make a new kind of developer by his or her experience in developing housing. All right. But I'm wondering why can't a financing organization right, have a subsidiary company? That is a housing association. Why not? Um, so at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the profit matters. And uh, especially um, within the structures like uh, a private institution or financial institution, we or, or somebody, I mean, whomsoever get into the housing or to the real estate market, they need to make money. I mean, if uh, in a sustainability in India, we do call it uh, at the bottom line. The bottom line is so important uh, for uh, any of the real estate or or to the um, uh, or to the any institution which is getting into the real estate part of it. Land, as you rightly mentioned, is one of the biggest hurdle of. Uh, of dealing with that bottom line and probably um, probably if uh, land not subsidized I'm, I'm, I'm very against uh, using the word subsidy or incentives they are very very dangerous words to use particularly in India uh, I would say uh, if, if it can be managed land um, you will find a lot of organizations and a lot of associations uh, coming up. I know an uh, association of laborers in Nagpur, I, uh, Aurangabad, I'm sorry. So it's a huge association of laborers uh, and, and workers as uh, Hussein mentioned that, you know, uh, they have actually built up an association, small association, they are developing these land and we are funding them. They are like five lakh, 10 lakh rupees units. And uh, we, as a funders, as, a, as an institution, we are we are we are doing debt funding there, and it's it's a straight out funding. Um, uh, yeah. They may choose for a mortgage loan, they may not. But mm. uh, but but again, the the biggest hurdle for for any association to come up and to manage is the land. Yeah. 
once we when 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 we get away with that aspect of land and probably profiteering um is kind of i'll say required if if i don't make a profit from the land i'll probably not be um uh, really interested in creating something which uh, uh which which does not give me something back or the, there is no payback from it so i i do believe that these kind of you know the, the structures that vidhi is saying are do exist in india but in small pockets in small numbers where they are uh, operating in the effectively uh but at the same time uh, we need to have a very solid policy or or an understanding which you know supports these kind of structures these kind of institutions to survive and to and and to and to uh, you know uh, and and to grow from from one point to another because we want these institutions to be profitable so that they is and develop a land and then sell them off create more land bank create more uh, social housing and be valuable to the entire system so uh, to me um, the land is the biggest hurdle if somebody can manage because i i i have really given a lot of thought about that uh, mm -hmm. how to manage the land uh, and it's and it's, it's still a question to me well okay i think uh, we can we can continue and uh, you know for a long time with our discussion uh, i certainly got a you know there's a lot of learning and i've reached a different how shall i say different platform or a different plateau of understanding the complexities of the situation and even more strengthened in my conviction that there is a need for inventing institutional frameworks that can actually fulfill the need for housing um but maybe each one of us or together sometime we can put our heads together to uh to move this agenda of invention of a new framework uh for housing in india so i i think we would if you don't i think we should now conclude um this time is more or less up i would like to ask kirti to come in and from his vast and long experience and his wisdom tell us what he has thought while he heard all of us speak kirti sadhya on mute hello can you hear me yep Uh, thank you Ash it's remarkable and i think how remarkable it is i think come to when i come to the second part of my small presentation which is a thank you uh, which i'll do a little later but let, let me very quickly come 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 up with some of the some of the, the thematic issues that came up uh my lo my notes are very long as a matter of fact i have 21 points uh, that Uh, i noted out of this this conversation i won't be able to go through all of them but i thought i'll quickly mention a few of them which i think are very critical number one is this that i think the entire affordability dialogue in the country is seen in a very limited context it is uh, this like be very uh, revolving around paying capacity of the of the potential customer it is on income and willingness to pay it talks about how much rent the, the, the person could pay am am i but that that person could pay and i think it's it's a very limited way of seeing affordability and i think i would like to kind of add four dimension to affordability affordability affordable to the end user affordable to the subsidizing state even if you don't like to use that word all affordable housing that exists gets subsidized one or the other way because it's not a market product and it it has to be affordable to that entity itself affordable to the city 
cities plan system and affordable to the environment. If you're talking about formal housing, you know what kind of costs, environmental costs involved. And therefore, if we're talking about affordable, and if you really bring all these four or five components, you how you define affordable changes and changes substantial. I don't really have time to kind of discuss that, but I thought I'll just mention a point. Second important point I think about affordable housing, and I'm talking this as a as a as as, as an architect who do large number of uh, shelter homes. And also as someone who's involved in studying this for a long time, the entire issue of shelter size is not been talked at all. What has happened is this over a period of time, the last 40 years, 50 years that we've been involved in some form of, of, of uh, affordable shelter, that means you know, some form of social housing. If you see history, the square feet of unit being provided has reduced from 600 square feet to 150 square feet. All along essentially is a function of the cost and how much you could build with the very limited amount. Now, and I think I'm talking about, I think, you know, 1950s, when I think, you know, they're building labor housing projects. That is what was called workers housing project. To now, I think, you know, 300 square feet you know, of shelter that is being built. It's a huge come down is half. Families need is, remains more or less the same, you know, because, you know, whether you are Ambani, or whether you are you are a mill worker, you have four people, five people, you require a certain amount of space. And this space, as a matter of fact, always been defined as paka space that you could provide. And I really think that you know hardly anyone has given given, and I'm not talking about you know as a matter for larger unit. As a matter of fact, of some work I did in Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka after the tsunami, they have a policy. They build nothing which is less than 550 square foot because they think you can't really can't build 150 square feet and 200 square foot houses. So point one is making is this, that if you really have a limited resources and if you are building smaller houses, you've got to examine how do you extend the space? How do you make, how do you make it stretchable? How do you make it bigger? How do you kind of deliver more? And therefore, the whole idea of not only build space, not only the covered space, but semi-open space, open space, all that becomes very, very important. It's, and how do you deliver that? And, 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 and all that, I think, up till now, we've been talking about when you're talking about ground story structures. But if you're doing multi-story, if you're doing 15 stories and 80 stories, how could you do that? I don't want to go into that detail, but I think it's absolutely possible. It is needed to be done. We have just launched a very interesting competition called Improving Livability of Small Houses. I'll be amazed how it could be done. Like say, for instance, you know, I, I know it's possible to add 70 square feet in a 300 square foot house. It's possible to build 70 square feet of mezzanine space at no real cost. I know it's absolutely possible to build, I think, on the terraces at just 12% extra cost, which could then eventually get converted into, into, into additional rooms. There are areas in which we have not really examined at all because we don't design these small houses ever. And, and it's, it's a huge area to be looked into so far architects and designers are concerned. And therefore, I think you know, we're going to talk about incremental housing, not only on the ground, incremental houses, even if it's a multi-story, is possible, is doable, and I think you know, it's required to be I think, examined very, very, very clearly. The next point is this, that you know, whenever we talk about affordable houses, we're only talking about affordable houses in the context of square feet area built and provided. But we're not looking at the social part uh, aspect at all. Like say, for instance, a, a, a good neighbor is a huge social asset for a community, for a poor family. And we are in a situation where you buy a four crore rupee apartment, you don't have choice for a neighbor. And we built a township you know, way back in 35 years, 40 years ago, 
for 2,500 families in Ahmedabad. And every single family had a choice of choosing his or her neighbor. It's possible. And the and, and moment you really allow this option, and I think this happened in Ahmedabad, and we had 50% Hindus and 50% Muslim in that particular community and that project. And you essentially talking about a warring community, you're talking about conflict community. Still, they were given open option to choose their neighbor and they made remarkable choices. Hindus and Muslims chose toilet to be shared. Hindus and Muslims shared backyard to be shared. Hindus and Muslims shared courtyard to be shared. So what I'm trying to say is that if you start looking at the social dimension of housing, if you start, you essentially, I think, you know, add enormous amount of value to livability, to improving that, not only looking at just a square foot. I also wanted to kind of bring in this particular point that Ashok brings in time and again, that when you look at the market-driven or even state-driven affordable housing, you're talking about sustainability component, which means uh, water recycling, energy uh, uh, saving, water disposal, waste disposal. They said these are the areas which one could only have handle in the upper end housing. As a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's affordable housing segment which needs them the most. And therefore you've got to kind of develop a mechanism by which first of all, it has not to be cost adding proposition. But even if it is, you've got to kind of find a by which you could provide the sustainable component to affordable housing, which are largely missing. Next point, I think very quickly is the building bylaws. You won't even believe me how absurd they are. We're building bylaws uh, where if, say, if you're doing affordable uh, uh, housing, even if it's 18 story and in a, over a building, you are essentially building 160 apartments, you don't require any parking. No, I'm not talking about parking for the vehicle. I'm talking about parking for the places, the, the utilities and the instruments that the poor people have. You walk into any, I think, you know, affordable housing program, you don't even have walking space because, you know, there are they're small little uh, tailors, you know, there are small little kind of gardies, you know, there's small little kind of things are stored there. And, uh, and, 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 and what is, and not even that, look at the other part. If you really move from affordable to affordable housing from say upper end housing, suppose the builder which was building 1500 square foot house and now decides to be 300 square foot house, instead of fitting in one family, he's fitting in four families, four kitchens. And therefore not four people, you're talking about 20 people. Now, if you're really going to have 20 people are living, you've got to kind of examine what will happen to open spaces, what will happen to the needs which not exist at all. So if you really look at the whole, whole series of things which are re required to be looked in the context of affordable housing, uh, doesn't exist at all. And if you're, really, if you're building on such a scale, there's a great need to examine it, to bring in, which is creative, which is supportive, and which is facilitative. It's not really happening at all issue of land has come up time and again. Uh, it, it's very, very clear that uh, what has happened in our cities is this. I've been practicing architects for the last, last 50 years. And by the time I think construction has gone up by three times or four times, land costs have gone up by 50 to 100 times. Question of affordable land doesn't exist at all. And when we talk about call land, we're talking about money cost of land. We're talking about economic value of the land. We are not talking about social value of the land, even though land also has a very important social purpose to kind of solve. Land has a very important public good to, to solve. And therefore, in the Indian context, we are talking about affordable housing, it's very important that state intervenes, market on its ails on its own will never be able to deliver. And I think there are ways of delivering, I think, you know, of land to people. Uh, uh, the whole idea of you know, uh, the shelter improvements, in situ, slum upgrading, 
with uh, with uh, with with uh, uh, with uh, with land which is given a, as a part of the deal is something doable as a matter of this country produce a policy called uh, cities without slums and in situ housing slum improvement as a strategy for it it is eminently doable we are not really following it up and the whole issue of land unless you deal with it and as, as was rightly pointed out we are not going to kind of go any anywhere in terms of how you you can you can deal with this another small little point is this that when we talk about affordable housing or housing you're talking about all component as if they are static they are talking about family size as static family income as static land value of the of the of the, of the location as as static and city is static. Nothing of this is static. Family is not static, it increases and grows. Family income grows. Land value of the land, a place where the, where, where the housing is situated changes and city's own structure changes. And therefore, unless you really kind of bring a, 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 a much deeper understanding of the dynamics you won't be able to design housing finance system. You won't be able to kind of design as you know, uh, units. And therefore to accept that when you talk about housing, you're dealing with very interesting change that is taking place within the system. And if you allow to kind of bring that in, your solution will change, your system will change, your institutions will change. Something we have not talked about, I think very much, and I didn't hear a word on, 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 of that in this particular meeting, is the cooperatives. We had an incredibly rich cooperative structures in housing. Gujarat and Maharashtra was leading this over. And this happened in 50s and 60s and 70s. They essentially managed land, they managed housing, they managed, I think, you know, infrastructure. They played a very interesting role with the, with the city authorities. And fair amount of interesting housing came up. And it's all disappeared, it's, 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 it's gone out of window. And there's a great need to examine in terms of how could you bring back the entire cooperative structure, which uh, delivered very interesting housing a uh, long time ago. Another small little point, which is very minor, but I just want to make is this, and this is what I showed, I don't even notice this. If you look, you look at the statistics of housing shortage in India, you'll be very surprised by the nomenclature. That 20%, which includes 4%, 5%, 8% of that, is essentially housing which is just not usable, which has to be discarded, which cannot be used. Other 80% is under the category of congestion. If 80% of housing shortage is defined as congestion, solution is not building new housing. Solution is to find ways by which you decrease your lessened congestion. I was just giving a small little example. As a matter of fact, I saw a friend of mine, family did this in part of Ahmedabad. There were four families living together in a joint family house. And over a period of time, family grew. So what they built was on the terrace, they built one extra room for each one and a toilet. And they've, they've been happily living there for a very, very long time. And therefore, I'm just giving a very simplistic example. But there's a great need to look at in terms of how do you kind of examine the whole issue of, uh, of, of, of congestion and how to kind of, uh, how to kind of deal, with the, deal with the congestion. So this uh, very quick, as I said, I didn't have much time. Uh, and I don't really have uh, time to kind of go through my long list of 28, but I thought I'll mention very quickly some of this so that you know it adds to wonderful things that have been said. Having said that, let me come back to, I think, you know, my last uh, important role of thanking you, everyone, of course, thanking Ashok. I've been pushing him for a very, very long time. I think, you know, it, every time I phone, I'm sure he must be, I think, you know, getting concerned that uh, this fellow is pushing me again. But finally, I'm delighted it's happened and it has been very remarkable. 
uh, in terms of uh, the quality of discussion that took place, all the three presentations that happened. We was very sorry, I think, you know, we couldn't have Arpna Mitra to, to join. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Vidhiji. Thank you, Hussain Bhai. Very interesting uh, presentation. I want to kind of uh, steal your slides and see them again uh, tonight or tomorrow. Uh, and Amor Bhai, thank you very much. You know, we brought in very late, but it's very interesting because you are funding small builders, and and they are not they are not in the trajectory. They are not being talked about, and they're playing a very big role. And you're doing the capacity building, where essentially, I think, giving them new tools, you're giving them, I think, a new reason. If a green building, it's, it's, it's a terrific idea. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for, for all this. Thank you, my friend Savnik, uh, for, uh, for spending time coming in and introducing the webinar series. Uh, as you know, this is the 57th via of webinar on one theme, which is rethinking Indian city. And we have had something like more than 300 experts and specialists come and talk. We have had something like 70 knowledge partners doing this together. And we are trying to kind of you know, convert this entire exercise, which has gone on for the last 15 months into a knowledge products and hopefully We'll be able to announce it sometime next week into the how we go about doing so. So thank you, Sonic, and of course thank you, my colleague Aniksha, uh, Ankisha, who works behind the scene, but makes all this possible. She invites people, she designs posters, she writes to each one of you, she listens to my shouting, and it's, it's absolutely remarkable. She's a great help in doing this. So thank you very much, Ashok. Thank you very much, all of you. You learn a lot and it's a very useful exercise. Thank you. Well, thank you all from my side. And um, we shall keep the conversation alive one way or the other. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.